Welcome everyone to season two of We Are Being Transformed. As you all know, here we explore liminal spaces and the contours of reality. The myriad of ways people interact with their world through the vehicles of ritual, cult, and lore. Our guest this morning is Dr. Jeffrey J. Kripal. Dr. Kripal holds the J. Newton Razor Cha Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University in Houston, Texas. He's the author of Esalen, America, and the Religion of No Religion, authors of The Impossible, Superhumanities, and the topic of our discussion today, Mutants and Mystics, Science Fiction, Superhero Comics, and the Paranormal. So Dr. Kripal, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. I'm happy to be here. So today we're going to be having a bit more of a freeform discussion. I know a lot of people, when they watch the show, we focus a lot on antiquity. But as you say in your book, there's kind of a super story going on. And I felt that it's something that we can just as somebody who's into comparative religion myself, we can kind of see the, that going throughout history. I feel it's important for the viewer to get to know you a bit and your approach before proceeding with the subject. So what's your superhero origin story? Well, I grew up in the 60s and early 70s. You know, I, I actually read these comics when they were just comics and they didn't mean a whole lot. They, they It was sort of inappropriate literature. Actually, you bought them in drugstores where your dad bought pornography, actually. There was always something slightly off uh, about them. I grew up, I became extremely religious in my teenage years, and I wanted to become a monk. And I joined a monastic seminary um, run by the Benedictines in Missouri. I eventually got interested in the comparative study of religion because I I came to the conclusion that, that God was much bigger than any particular religious tradition, and I wanted to see how how essentially religious experiences played out across the globe and throughout human history. And so I became a comparativist. I became something called a historian of religions, is what we, we called ourselves at the University of Chicago in the late 80s and 90, early 90s. I'm getting to my superpower, by the way. Um, when, uh, when I was living in India, writing my dissertation in the late 80s, I had, I think what most people would call a kundalini awakening. Um, and it was also an out-of-body experience. It might have been a near-death experience. I mean, you can frame it in all kinds of ways, but it was extreme. It was acute. And it resulted in a kind of uh, energetic uh, influx that that resulted in a lot of books that I've been writing ever since. Um, so my superpower, I mean, my origin story, it goes back to studying Shakta Tantra, actually, in, in Calcutta in the late 80s, and some kind of bizarre experience that I underwent while I was in bed, actually. It was, it was during the night. It wasn't with anyone, although it's a ritual context. I know I know ritual's big to you. It was, uh, it was during something called Kali Puja, which was a four-day ritual cycle in in. West Bengal at that point. It's really interesting. You mentioned you wanted to become a monk. I actually went through a phase like that myself in college when I first started getting into all this. It's my own kind of origin story before we get going, just because we're talking. I was never religious growing up. I have Catholics in my family. My grandmother was a Catholic. She instilled in me love of Greek and Roman mythology. She's the first person who bought me like Sophocles and, and the Greek plays to read. So I always love that. But she never pushed it on me. I mean, I'm the type of person who I said my prayers and I kind of understood that there was this power, but I never really went to church or anything. It never really occurred to me. I wasn't against it. I just found it fascinating later in life. I was into a lot of Gothic music, like Gothic industrial and stuff like that. So there were these bands from the eighties in, in England who were, uh, like the mission, the sisters, the mercy feels the enough woman. I really love the imagery and I really love the lyrics. And uh, I was watching a lot of The Last Temptation of Christ. And I started reading all this stuff because the half price books near where I live, I grew up in Texas. So <laughs> there's a half price books like on uh, in Austin that I used to go to all the time. And uh, they had a great used religious book, book section, like with all the Boltmon stuff, not like the, you know, the, the secret and all that, uh, you know, fluffy stuff. They had like Boltmann and, and and Heidegger and they had like Niebuhr, all that stuff. And I just, I bought that and I started really getting into it. And I got into Hilly Garden. I, I, I went through that phase where I was like, I really love this, but I, I'd like to be a monk, but I've never been to church. So, you know, so I, I so like I started, I went to college and did the history, uh, medieval emphasis and philosophy with an emphasis in religious studies. So I had a great professor, very important in my formation, her name was Dr. Rebecca Raphael. So Dr. Raphael, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate everything you did for me. 
yeah, so, um, you know, and then things happened and I work in an office now, but it's all good. So, because I still love <laughs> this stuff. Well, you, you, you host a podcast, right? Called yeah, Leader. yeah, yeah. Well, so, uh, I mean, why not, right? Something clicked. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was like, oh, okay. The, the, my uh, my studies weren't useless after all. But anyways, <laughs> no. So uh, so that's my origin story. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Like for me, I think what I really loved about it was the religious experience was beyond like any kind of dogma. Like you say in your book, a paranormal kind of experience. For me, the greatest of all time still is Paul Tillich. You know, the ground of all being and, you know, the courage to be. I still like find something for lack of a better term, religious. Tell it's great. Let's get to the book itself. I love this emphasis that you put throughout the chapters. You discuss seven myth themes of the superstore. So those would be respectively divinization slash demonization, orientation, alienation, radiation, mutation, realization, and authorization. I know it's really <laughs> impossible to briefly summarize, but if we could just kind of go through these. And so I, you know, obviously I just came up with those. I mean, they all rhyme, right? They all, they all, they all sort of sound alike. I came up with them because I, I really do as a comparativist, I'm interested in the big picture now. I'm not interested in the little picture and, and most, well, all human beings live in a little picture. <laughs> I would say most, I would say all of us do. And so it's hard to wrap our heads around the bigger picture that is being told in the history of religions. But these are just themes that I think occur constantly in different cultures and different places. You know, the basic argument of the book, or one of the arguments, is that science is the new kid on the block. And it's really changing how people have religious experiences and certainly how they live in a mythology or in a worldview. And they're using scientific terms now, whereas, you know, three, 400 years ago, they would have used religious terms or philosophical terms. So people don't talk about being saved any, and at least the people I work with don't talk about being saved, but they talk about evolving, you know, so there's a kind of evolutionary motif that that kicks in there or they talk about being radiated there's some kind of subtle energy you know they they invoke the language of physics of quantum physics or evolutionary biology or cosmology or hyperdimensionality or whatever it is to talk about different religious states and and that's really what the book's about is is trying to track how that 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 change in the way we think of ourselves and think of our world is taking place. Specifically in the book, you trace it with the last kind of 200, 300 years of history and how these, for lack of a better term, pop culture movements became mainstream with things like comic books and pulp magazine. I have a friend in the chat, Stephanie Shea from Rejected Religion. Welcome, Stephanie. She likes to talk about a culture. Yeah. And a culture is pretty much like how the reception of how magic is portrayed in the media and all that. And it's really interesting. You talk about these precursors like theosophy, Rosicrucianism, that really influence these weird tales and these pulp stories. We'll get to that. You note in the book, I love this, the paranormal often needs the pop cultural form to appear at all. As finite beings in a particular geographical place and historical moment in time, we all interpret our experiences through the filter of a Sitzim Lieben or a, a place in life existence. So um, I didn't know if you could just kind of talk about this whole concept of pop culture filtering the <laughs> paranormal experience. I mean, let's we'll go back to Stephanie's uh, point. I mean, this notion of a culture, I don't, I don't know the actual history of that term, but I know that Chris Partridge uses it to talk about this fusion of music and popular culture and mystical experience. And I use it in the book. I, I certainly use popular culture as the medium or the frame through which a lot of these ideas are talked about today. And this is how it gets through. One of the other arguments of the book is that you can't really take the paranormal seriously in the sciences. You can't really take it seriously in the religions. But you could talk about it and entertain ourselves in popular culture with it. It seems to it seems to get by. There's there seems to be a kind of pass that is allowed for the paranormal in popular culture where it's not allowed in the scientific community or in the religious communities. And and I find that interesting. I think it gets by because it's just seen as fantasy or it's just seen as entertainment. And again, one of the things I'm trying to show in the book is that actually 
people have these experiences all the time. The, the, these, these are not fantasies. These are not science fiction stories. Although, of course, there are also fantasies and there are also science fiction stories. It's a kind of both and. And that's kind of the more difficult point of the book is that for people to have these experiences, they appear in the imagination or they appear in the physical world through the imagination. And so they're never appearing in and of themselves. They're always appearing in some kind of cultural form, or some kind of story, that's essentially, um, to put it bluntly. It's what I call the trick of the truth. The, the truth can't appear naked. It has to appear clothed in some in some myth or some story or some ritual or some some idea that's not exactly right, but it's pretty close. I love that because I was talking to a scholar of uh, history of philosophy named George Boy Stones, and we were discussing as far back as the Stoics and even before that, the allegorical method of reading the mythological texts like the archaic text of Homer or Hesiod. These texts were considered to hold some kind of truth that went beyond the allegory and the, the poetic meter and, and convey something bigger. So we're doing the same thing in American pop culture. Sometimes, Jason, I'm not suggesting that every time you see a superhero movie or you you know read a graphic novel or something that you're having a religious experience or that the artist or author did. That's, that's not the point. But the point is, is that these stories have their roots in older religious stories and particular kinds of religious experiences that go way, way back. And that often the artists and the authors who who really came up with these characters were themselves embedded in these occult or these paranormal cultures. And that's why they're coming up with these characters. And that, of course, gets lost. We We forget that as a culture. And so, you know, Thor becomes Thor and, you know, Dr. Strange becomes Dr. Strange. But but in their roots, you know, in their 1960s origins with Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, these were occult characters that were just suffused with with claims of experience and, and claims of, of, of truth, actually, and, and not just fiction or fantasy. So in the book, we're introduced to some very colorful precursors to this a culture current that subsequently permeates the pulp magazines and later comic books, you know, things like Rosicrucianism, Theosophy, Frederick Myers, Charles Fort, Ray Palmer. Can we discuss some of these figures a little bit? The earlier figures that I treat are, are basically designed to show that all religion is made up in some sense. In other words, the imagination is always at work, even in traditions that we think where it's not made up or imagined. And that doesn't mean it's not true or it's not real. This is this is the basic binary I'm trying to get away from: is that that which imagined is false, and that which is somehow scientifically proven is true. And I want to explore this other realm where that which imagined is in fact true, but it can it has to be imagined. To appear at all. It can't appear in simple form. Rosicrucianism is so interesting because as a as a religious movement in the 17th and 18th centuries, it's it's essentially a made-up religion. It starts out with fiction, literally fiction. But people read this fiction as not fiction and they they take it up and it turns into an actual kind of occult movement. I think all occult movements, all religious traditions are like that in their origins, and then they become stabilized and and socialized, as it were, and then they take on this reality that they didn't have at the beginning. And so I'm trying to get, I'm trying to break down this notion that popular culture or the comic book is somehow fluff, and the real stuff is, is, is somewhere else. I, I want to say, no, actually, it's in popular culture where the human imagination has the most room to, to grow and to express itself. And it's, it's essentially a privileged place of the paranormal because of that. So I'm really trying to break down people's assumptions about elite culture and popular culture and trying to make this argument that the impossible always is happening, but it can only appear in the forms of the culture in which one exists. And most of us exist in popular culture to some extent. We don't walk around in elite cultures all the time. Yeah, that's a great point. I did a show recently on Lucian of Samosata, 
And uh, Lucian's a really great example from antiquity of someone who's combining these currents of high and low culture together in very innovative ways. So I like how, you know, people like Fort and later the comic book creators and the pulp writers will do this. You know, for me, I mean, to talk about the ancient world for a minute, first of all, it's a big comic book, Jason. I mean, the ancient Greek world, it, it, it's a comic book. And, you know, we, we can imagine it as somehow noble with all of these temple walls and all of these white statues. But of course we know now that all of those white statues and all those temple walls had really gaudy kind of paint painted on them. I mean, they were essentially living comic books. And that's essentially the argument of this book is that, yeah, we don't build temples anymore to our gods. We we put them in comic books and movies, but it's, it's really the same human impulse. And you even see the same thing. You see the same gaudy colors and you see the same... Uh, feats and the same abilities, you know, just replayed. Superman was based on Hercules. That's not a theory. That's that's just a fact. Yeah, certainly so. With later iterations of the Superman the topos with, uh, of course, Captain Marvel, you know, that's actually in the name, right? <laughs> uh, Shazam. Like, that's all from the Greek gods. So it's very Oh, yeah. Well, and again, it's not just Greek influence, of course. And, you know, the Nietzsche and Ubermensch is behind the Superman, too. I mean, there's a lot of influences. I, I don't want to just reduce everything to ancient Greek and Roman culture. But those mythologies or those stories are definitely part of, of what we're talking about. I feel like the centerpiece of your book, at least for me, was your discussions on radiation and mutation, which are respectively in chapters three and four. Yeah. In this, you really make a great case for these specific characters as countercultures. So just long story short, why are X-Men and Doctor Strange counterculture? <laughs> okay. That's, that's a loaded question, um, Jason. First of all, you're wearing a Doctor Strange t-shirt, so obviously there's a connection there. Doctor Strange is more counterculture than the X-Men were in the 60s, by the way. The X-Men were basically a failed comic book when certainly when i was a kid there was it was definitely a b team maybe even a c or d team but dr strange hit the mainstream quite early and when you read dr strange certainly as a kid i didn't know how psychedelic it was but it it's psychedelic <laughs> i mean the the creators the artists and the authors who are writing and, and drawing those comics clearly are are doing things they're ingesting molecules and they're they're entering altered states and then they're encoding these altered states right into the right into the character and the storyline and and if you know something of course about the storyline of doctor strange you know it's just filled with these Tibetan or Asian influences, uh, but also these psychedelic or occult influences. So it's definitely a countercultural story in the sense that it was countering the culture. I mean, people don't remember the 60s if you were born after them, but um, those who lived through them know that this was a very tumultuous time. This was the civil rights movement. This was the Vietnam War. This was the birth of rock and roll. This was the birth of, of psychedelics. There was a very active youth culture that was counter to the conservative uh, or political culture of their parents and of the time. And the Marvel comics in the 60s, and this is what I really most remember about them, they had a kind of reflexive quality to them. And by that, I mean that the characters made fun, not only of the villains, but of themselves. If you read Spider-Man, you knew that this was a teenage kid that was always mocking not only those people who were fighting him, but was mocking himself. And the Incredible Hulk, the Hulk was always getting into fights with the U.S. Army, of all things. You know, I mean, th these were clearly not stable kind of cultural icons like Superman was, you know, over over in DC. Superman and even Batman was kind of blocky and kind of campy in the Batman sense, but didn't have this reflexive kind of countercultural oomph to it that the Fantastic Four certainly did. They were into space exploration and kind of early 
early NASA Apollo stuff. Spider-Man was this twisted teenage kid who wasn't quite sure of his powers. The Hulk was dealing with anger issues, you know. The X-Men start out with Kirby and Lee, and they are these young teenage kids who have these special abilities, and they're being trained by this older professor named Professor Xavier or Professor X. And it doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, it's kind of a flop. And then the team is recreated in 1975. It's made much more international, much more cosmopolitan. There's now a, a German mystical figure named Nightcrawler. There's an African a princess named Storm. There's a whole, the Wolverine gets, gets involved in the late 70s. There's a whole kind of set of new kind of cosmopolitan figures that come in. And the X-Men then become the kind of bedrock of the Marvel Universe in the late 70s and into the 80s and 90s. And, and it still is in some ways. This notion of mutation is really key to the whole thing. And the one of the things I try to show in the book is that this theme of mutation, it the X-Men didn't invent this. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby didn't come up with this evolutionary esotericism. It's It's been in the water for 100 years by the early 1960s, for sure, really, really since Alfred Russell Wallace and then, of course, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, and so this idea of evolution as sort of somehow the core of transformation is just in the water. It's, it's a cultural meme that is flowing, particularly through occult and paranormal subcultures. And then in the 60s, it, it arises through this fantasy for these adolescents called the X-Men, but doesn't really take off to the 70s and really only takes off because of this cosmopolitan notion. And the basic idea there is that young people don't fit in to the cultures they grow up with. They have special powers or abilities. I mean, what what young person does not grok or feel that that story? And there's this kindly liberal professor who takes them in to try to train and nurture their abilities. And there's this other guy named Magneto, who, who's sort of the counter to Xavier, but really is the Friedrich Nietzsche of the comic book world. And he's always basically saying, screw the humans, let's let's do the mutant thing, you know? And Xavier's like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. You know, let's let's all let's all get along essentially. Let's live together. And those are the really the two counterpoles of that X-Men mythology is is essentially screw the humans. Let's do the mutant thing. And then the counter message is no, let's do both. And and it's that conversation or that argument that spins out the mythology. That's that's really what I'm trying to argue in mutation. The entire Marvel corpus could really be seen as like children of radiation and mutation in a, in a strange sense. Every character is born. Obviously, this comes from Cold War fears, the post effects of the nuclear bomb, things like that. But X-Men is a great example of the first principle of the myth theme, you know, the divinization. It's kind of like two separate answers to this, this question. And Doctor Strange, of course, like you mentioned in the book, is a great example of orientation, which is a theme that, you know, is not, not new, obviously. For me, the most obvious example are Platonists throughout history. There's always like a huge emphasis on orientation, the East, things like that, the um, somewhere far away. And that culminates, of course, with a character like Superman, where it's alienation, right? We can't find anywhere in the world because everything's been conquered. So we have to orient that other places, obviously extraterrestrials, outer space, things like that are um, the next step. Um, but yeah, I just didn't know if we could talk a little bit about how these characters exemplify the orientation and divinization slash demonification aspects of your myth themes. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the whole notion of being a demon or being a god is the ancient way of putting this. That's how our ancestors would have talked about these abilities. They would have said, oh, that's a demon or, oh, that's a god. And you see this in characters like Nightcrawler again, who's literally seen as a demon, you know, by, by those outside the X-Men. But you also see this sort of deification go on as well. I mean, these superheroes are essentially 
identical to God's in a Roman or Greek sense. So the, I don't I don't think that ever goes away, Jason. I think that 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 motif of demonization and, and deification still exists in our world, but it's gradually being replaced by this notion of radiation or mutation. And what, one of the things I try to do with radiation is show that actually there are all these experiences of subtle energies that people report and to this day i mean i hear them i hear them every week by the way i get lots of emails from people experiencing this or that subtle energy and there's no there's no real language for these other than these occult or paranormal languages the, the scientific language really doesn't work or fit and so people will use the the scientific language but they'll use it in an unscientific way and and that's what I'm trying to show in this book is that the, this notion of radiation actually what really what really happens to people when they're radiated is they get cancer and they die, they don't develop superpowers. But we know from the history of religions that people get struck by lightning and they have out of body experiences and they have all of these sorts of radioactive like experiences and they do in fact develop superpowers. And so there's this ancient kind of human quality to this motif that I'm trying to get at. And I think what Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did in the 60s is they just sort of, that was their go-to, right? Oh, it's it's a radioactive spider or, oh, it was an atomic bomb test or, oh, whatever. You know, it's always, you know, let's, let's go to the easy way out here. And um, I don't think that's true anymore, of course, but that certainly was true in the 60s. Yeah, it's very interesting that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby were using the myth themes of radiation at that time to convey these further characters. One of my favorite visionaries is Hildegard von Bingen. I always maintained that she would use the terminology of UFOs today, as opposed to like the Catholic church, you know, cause that was the building blocks of her day. I mean, the UFO, first of all, runs through this whole book particularly Jack Kirby and, and Charles Fort were fascinated by what we call UFOs today. And they thought that they were somehow at the core of these phenomena. The UFO is usually today explained exactly in the terms that I described. These are extraterrestrial. These are visitors from outer space. In other words, we use the scientific quasi scientific language of our of our culture and our science to explain something that's happening that's a, a completely anomalous and what goes on in today is that we erase or cut out all of the paranormal aspects of the ufo experience because it doesn't fit into this this extraterrestrial model and so what i'm trying to again suggest in the book is that no actually everything everything's there the ufo is definitely part of this modern super story it's 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 like the fantastic four we've 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 taken the sacred and we've we've placed it in outer space but we're essentially talking about something that's deeply religious we just are no longer using religious language i wanted to explore the writer artist as visionary paradigm for a bit in your terms in the book this would be more the realization authorization model so how these paranormal currents of their personal experience translates into lore building and sometimes foundational myth. I'm reminded of examples from antiquity, such as the apocalyptic and visionary writings of the Hebrew Bible and the pseudepigraphical writings. This is carried over, obviously, into Nag Hammadi with things like the Sethian treatises, most notably Apocryphon of John. One of my favorites, obviously, from more modern times is William Blake. In the book, you have obvious modern examples like Grant Morrison, Alan Moore, chaos magicians who also happen to write comic books. Uh, but I think one who truly missed out on his calling as a true prophet was Jack Kirby. Mm -hmm. So a case could be made that Jack Kirby is the Homer of pulp culture from the seventies to now. So in the seventies, mm -hmm. you have things like star Wars, eighties masters of the universe into today, basically the entire Marvel cinematic universe and the DC extended universe takes from the building blocks that Kirby created. Whether you have fourth world characters like Dark Side, or you have the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which builds upon pretty much characters he created completely. He has this trilogy, which could really be summed up almost as like an apocalyptic treatise. It starts in Thor, it goes to fourth world, 
and then it ends in Captain Victory in the 80s. So I didn't know if you could give some of your favorite examples of these authors as visionary. I'm building on this model that I theorized in another book called Authors of the Impossible. And the argument is that paranormal experiences are first and foremost stories. And by that, again, I don't mean that they're just stories. I mean that the way that they play out in our lives is by embedding us in a story. And what a paranormal event essentially usually means or usually is trying to say to the person is, well, maybe you don't like the story you're caught in, so let's tell another story. So it's it's trying to wake this person up inside a story is the metaphor I'm giving. And so I, 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 you know, I refer to realization as the understanding that we're waking up inside a story. And authorization then is this decision to tell a new story and to define the human in a different way. And so I really do believe that paranormal experiences are story-related, but they're taking apart stories that we're embedded in, and they're trying to get us to tell new stories. So there's a kind of moral impulse or ethical impulse in, in the paranormal, even if it's quite negative, by the way, and the paranormal is often very negative. So that's really kind of the basis of what you're getting at. I think Jack Kirby, you know, Kirby was a World War II veteran and had clearly just experienced a lot of what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. There was a lot of trauma in his life, and it kind of comes out in his sort of aching, exaggerated physical bodies that he drew to such a fact. And I think it's no accident that he was fascinated by the paranormal. And that he is sort of at the bedrock of, of what we now think of as the Marvel Universe. I mean, he did help create the basic working principles of that of that universe. And I think he did it out of his trauma, and he did it out of his interest in the paranormal. And I think that's very obvious if you look if you look at his life. I really think that if Kirby had been born like in three hundred Common Era, like he would have been like one of those apocalyptic writers. <laughs> he would be writing like these treatises. You know, I'm a big fan of William Blake. Jason. I mean, I've written two books on Blake, and I spent years looking at his illuminations and his poetry. I, I think he looks a lot like Jack Kirby, actually. I, I, I think Absolutely. there's a, something very Blakeian about Jack Kirby, and there's very something Kirby-esque about William Blake. I think they're very similar figures in two very, very different historical eras. Absolutely. I, I think that they there are definitely kindred spirits and the active consciousness, so to speak. Kirby and Blake definitely had this concept of a continuing story that they told throughout their art. Blake had this notion that everything was imagination, but he, you know, he capitalized it. He again, he wasn't making a reductive argument about the imaginary. He was saying, no, we actually imagine the worlds we live in and and what we're in right now that we think is all sense based is in fact a function of our of the imagination and so he meant it in a very dramatic kind of charles ford sense of this is truth fiction that we're in and we can change the story we're in and that's really the the message of mutants and mystics it's not just look at all these weird stories <laughs> the, the message is look at all these weird stories and we can tell another one now or we can tell many others right now, more likely. And um, I think that's really, ultimately, it's about hope and, and about the future and not, not simply about the past. Getting out of the realm of comic books and into sci-fi, of course, there's no better example of this type of mystical experience translated to pop culture than, of course, Philip K. Dick. Can we discuss Dick's Vallis work and the impetus behind it for a bit? Well... Philip K. Dick, of course, was a major American uh, science fiction writer who died in, I want to say, 82. Hollywood has loved Dick. They've translated a lot of his short stories into major motion pictures, but they've always avoided what was most important to Dick himself, which was this late-in-life uh, Vallis experience. Vallis stood for Vast Active Living Intelligence System, and he was essentially irradiated by this cosmic force in February and March of 1974. And he wrote, actually, he wrote four novels out of that experience. He wrote Radio Free Album Youth, which was really the first thing he wrote, but was then 
pub- published posthumously. He wrote Vallis, he wrote The Divine Invasion, and he wrote The Transmigration. There you go. And these novels are really Dick attempting to make sense of his Vallis experience. Again, it's that that paranormal root of creativity that I'm trying to, to get at in the book and that so drove Philip K. Dick from 1974 to the day he died in 1982, really. And then Blade Runner comes out as a movie shortly after he dies, and then there's a whole series of other movies that are made uh, after his books. But again, no Hollywood director has touched Vallis. I think that's sad, <laughs> but it's also predictable. Yeah, it's a missed opportunity. The uh, biggest missed opportunity besides something like Vallis or is that, that they're not making a Nag Hammadi cinematic universe. <laughs> they would just that those would like can you imagine the special effects like can you imagine like an apocryphon of john movie something like that just that cosmology just all well you know effects would be amazing you, you know jason I, I held this four-year series of conferences on the paranormal and popular culture and i invited a lot of hollywood people to it and i basically asked them this question i was like can you make a film or a movie about the paranormal that doesn't involve spandex or things blowing up. And they said to me, no. (laughs) And I was like, why not? And they were like, well, we don't know if it'll make money. We don't know if that'll work actually. Um, But we know what works and we know what makes money. So we're just going to keep doing that until, until of course we don't make money anymore at it. That was 12 years ago. Maybe that's changed. I hope so. But that was certainly the answer 12 years ago, was there's no Nag Hammadi movie series because it won't it won't make a lot of money, which is what they think. That's the first thing I'm funding if I ever make it big in venture capitalism or, or something. Um, but yeah, I think they're headed in the right direction with something like Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. That movie was very occult. And that was very amazing. It was a deconstruction of all these concepts. So if you haven't seen everything everywhere all at once, I I highly recommend it. It's uh, uh, quite a joy to watch. Yeah, it's very interesting just getting back to the other concepts of uh, the myth themes. One thing that struck me while reading the book, it's not mentioned, but just in terms of sci-fi, cyberpunk and William Gibson in particular with things like Neuromancer and Mona Lisa Overdrive or his collection Burning Chrome, there's a lot of emphasis on divinization augmentation orientation you know there's a lot of japanese companies far off somewhere that control the world colonization you know things like that that's just an observation you know when i wrote this book it's really about jeff's childhood (laughs) so it's it's really about the 60s and 70s there's a lot of stuff that comes later all the video game gaming comes later anime manga all that stuff comes later And I just don't know a lot about that. I don't know hardly anything about those things other than what I imbibed through my my own children and and as a teacher. So you can only you can only write about what you know, Jason. You can't you can't write about what you I suppose you can write about what you don't know, but um that's not that's not what what I try to do. Yeah, no, I I would highly recommend um if you haven't read uh Gibson to read some of his work. It's quite um interesting like there's a lot of human augmentation david litwa wrote a book called post-human transformation and he really mentions this post-human transhumanist aspect and uh he hasn't mentioned it either but i draw the same kind of comparisons so post-humanism and transhumanism are very big in the humanities and i certainly know a lot about those those philosophical and literary movements really what i'm trying to explore in, in the book is is what we might call superhumanism it's really not post-human or transhuman in the philosophical senses because it there's a kind of transcendent component to it that that I think is a generally lacking in post-humanism and, and transhumanism, which are very much more about decentering the human and using technology to augment the human, where superhumanism is about really altered states. And and essentially becoming a deity, essentially, or becoming a demon, depending on one's view, I suppose. But that actually ties into my last question, um, which in the book, in the conclusion, you say that ultimately your conclusion is that we still lack a story big enough for the soul. So can you elaborate? Well, I don't think we do. I don't think we have a, a big enough story that, that 
is faithful to who we really are and that can tie us all together. I think we have a lot of different stories that are pulling us apart. And I think the attraction of science today with something like the Big Bang and evolutionary biology and cosmology is that it's it's a big story and we're all a part of it. And it does tie us together, whether we want to be tied together or not. And so I think we need more of those big stories, Jason, and we need to honor and understand why people want to be different or want to affirm differences, but we also need ways to connect ourselves. I think we have to do both at the same time and not one or the other. And I just don't see that a lot. I don't see a lot of people offering ways to connect us. I see a lot of people offering ways to disconnect us, but not but not to connect us. And I think that's that's a real urgent need at the moment. Absolutely. We need more both ends and not either ors in life, I would say. So Dr. Kripal, this has been an honor. This has been such a rich discussion. Feel free to use this time to plug whatever you'd like. I suppose just to go to my website, jeffreyjkripal.com, and just look at what I'm doing or look at what I've done there. Everything's summarized there. You can figure out what you're interested in if you're interested in any of it. And that's okay too. You know, I, I do what I do and I teach what I teach. And I'm a, at the end of the day, I'm a professor. And that's just what I am and what I do. And I'm happy with that. So people can take that or leave that as they see fit. Well said. Well, Dr. Kripal, thank you again. And you have a pleasant morning. Okay. You too, Jason. Be well. Take care.